So like all the reserves in the system, South SLU is a partnership, a state federal partnership with NOAA. And um, here in Oregon, our partner is the Department of State Lands. And I have just, sounds like you all are pretty familiar with this. So I um, stuck a map of all of the reserves in the system. We now have, as of January, 30 protected estuaries around the United States. Um, and I thought it was, the map is striking talking to you all because we are um, both NERS, both estuarine sites, but very far apart, almost 3000 miles apart from one another. If you can see us on the map there, uh, which is I think really pretty fun. So we'll have some, I think I'll probably talk about some things that are similar in the habitats around you and probably some things that are really different from New Jersey. And I wanted to explain a little bit about what the Department of State Lands is because it is not the kind of agency, it's not something that exists in every state. It's essentially a natural resource agency. Um, and a lot of what it does are things that a, a Department of Conservation or Conservation and Natural Resources might do in another state. So the Department of State Lands, one thing that's different out West is um, certainly that we have like more public land around and a big part of what the Department of State Lands does is management a lot of a lot of its public land. And some of those are rangelands in Eastern Oregon. Um, so out in the high desert with cattle ranging on them and some of them are um, farmland, some of them are forested timberlands. So that's a big part of what the Department of State Lands does. It also does all the wetlands and waterways work. So permitting, regulation, mitigation, um, and conservation work around wetlands, which is why it is a great partner for the South Slough Reserve, because we are, um, of course, set up to protect um, a really unique kind of wetland. And so what I have here, are just two images of the South Slough estuary. Um, the South Slough, ah, oh, now I wish I had another image in there, but the South Slough estuary is just one um, piece of a wider bay. So we're part of uh, just one arm, the Southern arm of the Coos Bay estuary. So what you're looking at in both of these images is a view north, so up the slough, toward the out toward the ocean. So we're actually um, at the, the top end of the reserve, which is the south end of the reserve. And <clears throat> I think this is a great time to looking at this land from this perspective, both in the image on the left, which is I think from about 2000, and then the Google image on the right, it looks like this is a, pretty undeveloped sort of pristine looking swath of land around our estuary. So it gives the idea of um, a pretty protected body of water. And that, that is true in a lot of respects, but this land has had a lot of changes over time. And another thing I think that I'm gonna take the opportunity to talk about while we're looking at this space together is just the acknowledgement or the reminder that this land for thousands of years was home to native people. The Millic Coos people were the native people who resided in the South Slough estuary proper. And there were um, another uh, Coos people who spoke a similar language um, just around the corner of this picture in Coos Bay. Um, and those people lived on this land for thousands and thousands of years before white settlers came. But these people are still in our area today and they still are regular stewards of the land as water and of our communities. So the Milik Coos and the Hannes Coos people from the Coos Bay region are now members of three different federally recognized tribes. And those are the Confederated Tribes of the Coos, Loramqua and Sayusla Indians the Coquille Indian tribe and the Confederated tribe of Siletz Indians. They all have ancestors who lived and worked and visited and traded in our waters here. And we like to pay respect to their ancestors and to the families 
and elders living today, which is, I think, a good lead in for my next slide. So I decided to talk a little bit about the natural and human history of our place of the South Slough, which gives it a little bit of context, gives me an excuse to show some really good pictures. And it's a good um, lead in for why we've done the restoration or why we're working on the restoration that we're working on. So I've got a lot of words, but they'll come in bits and pieces. Uh, the South Slough estuary is a drowned river valley or a coastal plain estuary, which means it formed as sea levels rose about you know, 10,000 years ago at the end of the last ice age. When sea levels were rising, this area was just a single river and then flooded and became our wide, broad estuarine place. <clears throat> it is surrounded by large coniferous forests. So the forests around the estuary are primarily um, different species of conifers. We do have a few deciduous trees, but primarily large coniferous forests and then fresh and saltwater wetlands around this water. Um, some of our dominant or charismatic, I would say, megafauna on land include elk, deer, bear, mountain lions, bobcats, and beaver. And those are animals that are still here today, but in lower abundance or lower numbers than there would have, they would have been um, a thousand years ago. And then the waters, which, <clears throat> of course, are really important to us, excuse me, as an estuary, were filled with salmon, lamprey, crabs, oysters, sea otters, and seals. And most of those species are also still present in our estuary today, except for the sea otters. Sea otters were eradicated from Oregon and, and have not come back as a uh, population. And the salmon and lamprey and oysters have all, their populations have all changed and are not what they were um, a thousand years ago or so. Um, and as I already said, humans have lived in South Slough like the rest of the United States um, since at least the end of the last ice age. Native histories here usually say from the beginning or since time immemorial. So their stories go back before anyone can remember. And archeological evidence specifically from South Slough sites, show at least 6,000 years of residence in, um, in our area. I'm not sure I said this when we were looking at the map, but the South Slough protects about 6,000 acres around the estuary, and it's mostly contiguous. There's a couple little pieces. Um, and I mentioned this already too, but the Coos Indians for thousands of years um, manage these lands and waters for abundance, for their survival. So the land was not untouched, but it was cared for in a way that guaranteed the resources the people needed to survive through fishing, gathering, hunting, and cultivating the right habitats for their um, foods, their most important foods. And the Pacific Northwest, this is something that's a bit different than the East Coast, is still pretty active geologically. And our last major geological event on the coast, on the South Coast, was uh, an earthquake, a pretty catastrophic earthquake and tsunami about 300 years ago. And we see evidence of this, the earthquake and tsunami in um, soil samples and in our soil cores. There are places where you can still see uh, old forests, drowned forests. When the tide goes, goes out really, really far, you can see roots from old trees that were drowned when that earthquake hit and the tsunami came in. Um, and native stories talk about most of the villages along the Pacific Northwest coast have stories of a catastrophic flooding event um, around this time. And you can actually, there's evidence um, of the tsunami in Japan from that time because scientists in Japan were collecting data. So they have record records of that um, tsunami event. 
and it didn't it didn't change like drastically change our landscape the way um, sea level rise at the end of the last ice age did, but it did change a few things. Um, and then colonial set settlement, which began here in the 1850s, drastically changed the landscape. Um, and some of the activities that were most common in South Slough were mining for gold and coal, uh, timber harvest, and agriculture. And agriculture is the one we're probably going to talk about the most because um, that's what the restoration projects were focused on. Um, in 1855 or between 1855 and 1860, the native people were removed from this place. They were um, marched to a reservation and remained on that reservation for almost 20 years. Um, and then some, some people did return to this area. Um, also, for about 100 years, between 1850 and 1970, <clears throat> um, folks moved into the South Slough. There were several homesteads, um, a couple of different timber harvest operations where um, there, there were train tracks set up to move logs out of the slough. For a little while, there was a timber a, a mill to mine the logs. Uh, there were a couple of mining operations and then some different dairy farms. And we still see evidence of those activities in the landscape today. South Slough was established in 1974. It was actually the first reserve in the um, NERS system under the Coastal Zone Management Act. And at that time, I think in 1972, 1970, 1972 were the last logging years. So when the reserve, um, when the reserve was established in 1974, most of the landscape had recently been cleared for timber. And at that time, restoration and research in the land began. Uh, and I didn't, I think it's not in my bulleted list, but we are close to the coast and we do have a pretty big fishing industry in Charleston. So the mouth of South Slough Estuary has a harbor, which is the picture in the bottom right. And I was looking for some pictures of the fishing fleet, but I found this um, cute little clip of one of our charismatic megafauna. Um, but certainly the harbor, the mouth of the estuary has changed. Um, it has a jetty on both sides to keep the water open and um, a lot of infrastructure to support the um, marina and the industry. So we have now, we're approaching 50 years as a, re as a reserve. Um, education started at the reserve in the late 1970s. So the reserve has a pretty good reputation in the community. It's been a part of the community for a long time and we get a lot of support from um, most people in the community. Uh, our, at our reserve, our focus areas, and this is for research and education, are climate change, habitat protection, and invasive species. Those are um, our major issues and our major areas of study and teaching. Um, my slide's not moving forward, hold on. I might have to stop it, I guess. Hold on one second. Not sure what it's doing. I just have a couple other slides about the reserve. Um, oh no, sorry. We'll go really fast, don't look. Um, Oh, we can watch the seal again. So this was a harbor seal. I don't think I said it. I was waiting for it to be a surprise, but we have a lot of um, seals and sea lions in the harbor in Charleston and they hang out under the docks because they get scraps from recreational fishers and from the commercial fishermen. Uh, so our the reserve itself, we have about 16 to 18 staff. We work in all of those areas I just mentioned, education, science, stewardship, we have managers and administrative staff who are really essential to making the reserve function and our facility staff 
course, we could never do anything without them. Our facilities are, we have quite a few facilities. We have a visitor center that hasn't been open in two years, but normally has exhibits. So visitors can come inside and walk through an exhibit hall and learn about the reserve. There's an auditorium where we would normally um, offer presentations and classes. And then we have a classroom space um, in that building. We also have a lab building. Our science staff are all lo located on the University of Oregon's <clears throat> field campus, which is the Oregon Institute of Marine Biology. So that's the building in the background in this picture with all those cheerful high school students. We have a couple of housing facilities for interns and visiting scientists, and then vehicles, kayaks, native style canoes, small boats, and about five miles of hiking trails. Uh, and these are the same activities that Jay Siener does, so I'm not gonna go into them too much, but I did wanna just show off the pictures. So our science um, focuses on research. Sometimes people are trying to answer a specific question and sometimes they're collecting data for long-term data sets to watch for changes over time. Our education programs serve all audiences and we also have a coastal training program that offers professional training for coastal managers and decision makers. And that's the native style canoe in the picture. Um, in my screen, it's on the right hand side of the screen. So in case you weren't familiar with that, um, native people here traveled a, a lot by the water because there was so much water. And then we have a stewardship program that's focused on restoration of habitats and prevention and protection of habitats. So sometimes that's um, creating a new habitat and planting native plants or removing invasive species. And the reserve itself is all public land. Visitors can come and <clears throat> hike the trails, kayak, bird watch, look for mushrooms, pick berries. It's open um, year round, dawn to dusk. So I'm gonna stop pause, I'll just pause right here and ask if anyone has any qu general questions about the reserve before I talk about um, some of our restoration efforts. All right, yeah, if uh, you have a question, you can place it in the chat, take yourself off Oops. mute. I do have a uh, question. Um, <clears throat> When Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980, did you see any environmental changes in uh, in your estuary, uh, specifically maybe uh, acidification of the water due to the uh, the uh, the ash that may have been uh, released? I was wondering if you had a, a big impact in your area as a result of the uh, eruption. That's a great question. I don't actually know the answer. I think you, there are, um, you can see evidence in soil cores where they can, they can analyze for that one layer, but our water quality monitoring, we have um, a water quality monitoring program, just like the other reserves. That was not in place. That didn't start operating until the 90s, like 1992. So it wouldn't show up in our water quality data, but I don't know don't know the answer. Okay. Um, nothing significant. So there wasn't anything that that folks still talk about, although I'm sure it shows up in the in the soil. They use some actually, yeah, it is it is in the soil because it's one of those markers when we're, we're taking a soil core that shows up and helps figure out, you know, when you are in your soil core. So we okay. have um, we have some things we can look at. They they look for um, I think that volcanic eruption shows up. There were some, some of those, some of that bomb testing that was done in the fifties shows up in our soil cores. And we can see oh, that okay. um, we see a sand pulse from that tsunami. So um, other than using it to analyze soil cores, not that I know of, it's a great question though. And okay. it makes me wonder if we would have seen it in the water quality. Um, if we had uh, in the, um, the tsunami or yeah so the tsunami that just happened following that volcano in in Tonga mm -hmm. we um, we saw teeny pulses in our water quality but we did someone did have videos you could see about a 
I don't know, it was between 12 and 18 inches, the water rose and fell, rose and fell for about half an hour um, every 10 minutes or so. So that sort of shows up in our um, water quality. Okay. Yeah, good question. We have a question in the chat um, is asking about what invasive species have you found? Oh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> There's, there's quite a few. Uh, I would say, and I would like mentally, I just divide them up between terrestrial species and um, aquatic species. And some of our most pervasive ter terrestrial species are ones everyone would know, like we have English ivy um, in a lot of places, but we also have scotch broom and gorse, which are two plants that came from Europe and are pretty pervasive. Um, and in the water, there are several, the one that's causing the most problems for us right now is European green crab, which I think you also have in New Jersey and the reserve or the most of Oregon, really, I would say was pretty lucky for a long time. Um, the water would just stayed cold enough that we could, we didn't get any, um, established populations of green crab. They would float in as plankton, crab, crab star as plankton. So they would float in as plankton um, from the south, but their, uh, the water was cold enough most of the year that they couldn't reproduce. And in the last, um, starting in 2016, when we had this um, warm ocean effect off the Pacific Northwest, everyone called it the blob. Um, big pulses of warm water came into the estuary and the crabs were able to establish themselves. And now we're seeing generations of established green crabs. Um, and the reason they're an issue for us is because um, our native, there's a lot of native crab species, but the Dungeness crab is one of the ones that, um, it's one of the biggest industries in Oregon. It produces some of the most money. So for commercial fisheries, Dungeness crab is one of our biggest industries. and the green, the European green crabs are a bit more aggressive and sometimes will outcompete young Dungeness green or Dungeness crab and and or eat young Dungeness crab, and they also disturb some of the habitats, uh, the eelgrass habitats that young crabs and young fish need. Hey, uh, Jamie, I actually have a question, and it's probably something I should know. <laughs> sure. But I know a slough is an estuary, but what makes it different? I feel like I knew this and I forgot. So is there a difference? Uh, so kids ask, that's a, a question that kids ask a lot. Um, and I think what I usually say is it's just, it's a slow moving sort of backwater of, so the, the South slough, if, if I had a picture, if I had showed you a map of the whole Coos Bay, we're almost like um, a side arm of the estuary and a slough tends to be a slow moving mucky backwater to a main body of water. Okay. They don't have to be an estuary because there are a bunch of places um, like in the south, I think, where they have sloughs and they're, um, yeah, I think of them as just slow moving, swampy, mucky. Gotcha. Um, okay. That's helpful. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? All right. I think you can go ahead and um, keep going, uh, Jamie. All right. I'm going to switch over to hopefully I was going before um, to talk a little bit about some restoration that's been done. Are you all seeing my slides advance? No. No, it's still on recreation. Okay. Maybe there you it, go. Just, it wanted me to use a certain method. Um, so marsh restoration in South Slough, I think one of the cool things about existing so long as a reserve is that we have a lot of data and a lot of information about this place. Um, and some of that is these like really long-standing marsh restoration projects. Um, some of the first ones were done in the 1990s and that's where I'm gonna start 
talking. Um, but I think I'll, I'll explain first that what happened in a lot of um, estuaries in Oregon, a lot of coastal habitats, Oregon, the way the landscape works for those who, who have never been here is that it's, um, it gets steep really quickly close to the ocean. So most of our estuaries are pretty short and really quickly the elevation increases. So our coastal wetlands um, don't have a lot of space. There's not a lot of space between the ocean and where our forests start. And when settlers moved here and wanted to start farming and start raising things like cattle um, and sheep, there weren't a lot of opportunities for grazing on the coast because the land was so um, unfriendly and steep. And before it was harvested, it was also uh, full of ferns and giant trees. And the best place for someone to raise cattle or even to try to grow grain and grass was um, the wetlands because they were already flat and accommodating. So what people did, <clears throat> this is true in Oregon and Washington and Northern California, was um, diked off or blocked off the salt water from entering salt marshes and they dug ditches through the marshes to drain all of the water off of them to make them more accommodating for cattle. So most of the, not most of them, but I would say a whole bunch of the marshes in South Slough were um, diked and drained in the early 1900s. Um, and then they had cattle on them and some of them um, grew different grasses if they could get some of the uh, grasses cattle like to eat to grow. So, one of the first things scientists started trying to do in South Slough was return those wetlands to their natural habitat. Um, it's likely some of you have heard this before, but wetlands are really valuable. And we lost loads of wetlands in the United States throughout the 1900s because we didn't recognize their value for so long. Um, so there are some really essential ecosystem functions that a wetland does. Um, and then they are really important habitat. For us in the Pacific Northwest in particular, um, salmon really rely on our salt marshes and our wetlands as a place to hang out while they're transitioning. So salmon are born upstream in freshwater and migrate to the ocean, spend a couple years in the ocean and then migrate back and lay their eggs again in freshwater. And our section, the estuary section of that journey is really important to a salmon. So when a young salmon swims down and is getting ready to go out to the ocean, they use the marsh channels and um, wetland channels as places to hide. That's where they're acclimating to salt water and they get big and fat in there because they're eating tiny crabs and all of these really nutrient rich invertebrates and worms and tiny clams. And <clears throat> When the, when the dikes were put in, the salmon could no longer access those habitats and they lost a really essential piece in their journey. Um, so one of the first things um, the reserve focused on was trying to restore some of those places. And I have listed here on the right, um, a couple of different methods or ways restoration was first experimented with. It was pretty new at this time. Um, no one, it's, marsh restoration is still something we're trying to figure out the best way to do. Um, but at this point, a lot of what was done in the reserve was experimental. So there was some passive res restoration, excuse me, where um, the dikes are just removed and then the salt water comes back in naturally. So the tide starts coming back in and starts making its way back into a marsh that it was kept out of for a long time. And we're gonna look at that one first. So one place that that was done in this reserve is something that is now called Cox Pond. And I'm gonna explain these photos for you as best I can. So the photo on the far left is an image of what this marsh, what Cox Marsh looked like when the reserve um, was first established. You can see a main, well, 
I'll explain, there's a main water channel in the top right hand corner. And then there's remnants of old channels moving through the marsh um, in between the trees here. But the water, there was a, a main, uh, there was a channel dug straight through here to get all the water off of this space um, and get it directly back out into this main channel. So one of the, so what was done at Cox Pond and that's in the second picture, this channel was opened back up and all the dikes between these little meandering windy channels were opened back up and then it was just left to start flooding naturally again and start recovering, letting fish back in. Uh, something unexpected happened in Cox Pond where um, I think it was the first year after they did this and water started flooding back into these places that had been dry for um, 50 years or more. Uh, beavers moved in right away and they built a dam right across. So water started coming back into these places. Then the beavers came and they were like, great, we love this water. And um, they built a dam across the uh, place. So you can see this, um, these are both near infrared images which uh, show different. There's some benefits to looking at near infrared, show some, they show some differences in habitat and species. But um, in the first one where the channel just started getting water back into it, you can see water moving through. And then one year later, you can see this new pond that formed here. Um, and the reserve just left that, we accepted that. Um, beavers are great engineers, ecosystem engineers. They weren't aiming for a giant freshwater pond but that's what we got, probably not what it was originally, but um, another important wetland habitat. Um, another technique that was tried in the early 90s was um, putting in large woody debris into a stream channel. So this channel on the left in Fredrickson Marsh, this is something that when people came to use this marsh for um, agriculture, they dug, they did all this, digging by hand or with like, um, they didn't have much electric, electronic, big heavy equipment like we have today. So they dug these deep channels to get all of the water off the marsh. And one restoration practice that's being used or was being used was um, just to put in large woody debris and that starts creating scour as the tide comes in and out. It does, I know I said a slough moves pretty slow but it's, there's still a lot of change as the tide in current as the tide comes in and out. So um, the ground gets scoured out around this tree and creates new habitat for fish. So in a channel, a deep channel like this without, um, there's even if a fish were to get in there, there's not a lot of places for it to hide. There are fewer opportunities to find and eat invertebrates. So, um, that was this restoration process. And um, then there were some active restoration projects that were really interesting as well. Um, so one thing that was done where dikes were removed. So in every case, as much as possible, you remove the dike or some of the dike to start letting water back into the marsh. Um, in this, this was actually um, in about 2000, so this was much further along. It was, pretty, it was a pretty big project. In this case, um, there was a dike that followed the whole inside of this stream corner. And you can see at the very bottom of the picture, the dike is still sticking out there. Um, so where those, those trees are, that little bit of land, that dike would was originally um, blocking all of this marsh from the estuary coming in. And what uh, the reserve scientists did in this case was create different cells. And they were asking the question if, um, so what they did in each different cell was they created different elevations of marsh. Uh, and they were asking if we help the marsh by increasing its elevation, as soon as we let water back in, does it recover more quickly and will fish use that habitat more readily. Um, one thing that happens when a marsh is blocked off 
for from um, from its main source of water. Normally, water floods across the marsh twice a day, and sediment and debris from the ocean gets carried in and settles on the marsh surface. And the marsh surface builds over time. When that's cut off or blocked off, the marsh starts to sink, and it'll actually be at a lower elevation than the wetlands around it. And then, if it's used for um, agriculture, if there's cattle grazing on it, the cattle walking around will just increase that effect. Um, I apologize if you all can hear that. Someone is now chainsawing. Um, so in this case, they were testing to see if they could make the place better for fish faster. Um, and then go in the other room. And we're gonna look at one more restoration. I think we might have to skip the Prezi. Uh, I'm just gonna show it to you all. Uh, um, this one was, I think, the most exciting. So in this case, in Dalton Creek, there's another one of these channels that was dug to get the water off the marsh. They, they opened it back up to salt water. They filled that channel back in, and then they created a new channel um, that's Marsh channels are normally meandering and wandering. The water moves slowly through the place. Um, so what they did in Dalton Creek was they used dynamite. That's why I had that dynamite there to blow. They put a line in to create a new curvy channel. Um, and I thought that was really interesting and probably not something we would be as likely to try today. Um, and the last thing, so I'm not going to go to questions yet because I did want to show you all, especially since there is at least one high school science teacher on here. Um, probably the most active and the most elaborate restoration that was done in South Slough was um, in Anderson Creek, where dikes were removed, ditches were filled in, new channels were dug by heavy equipment. Um, plants, uh, the invasive species. So another problem with these agricultural marshes is that they um, they filled up with invasive species because there were cattle grazing on them. The cattle were eating different things and the seeds from the grasses that they were eating were establishing in different places. Um, so for this restoration in Anderson Creek, um, Bulldozers went in and scraped all the invasive species off the top of the marsh, and then they dumped the plants in the ditches on the side to fill in the ditches. They created new channel meanders by digging them with backhoes and then um, planted native plants. And I just wanted to show, so the images here in this Prezi, and I could send a link to anyone who's interested. This is actually part of a larger um, hey, set Jamie. of lessons about marshes. Yeah. Um, are you showing the Prezi now? Yeah. Can you not see it? No, we still see okay. uh, the present. Tape. Oh, there we go. Hold on. I'll just, um, it must not have switched with me. I was definitely showing, I thought I was showing you all. That's all right. Okay. So, um, I won't go back yet, but so what we're seeing is um, in the top left corner, what the marsh, what the water, this little um, mini watershed looked like before the restoration. Um, and you can see that it is flat in there. This is, I think, midway through the restoration. You can see they dug and scraped and changed things. They put in um, structure for the stream habitat and um, there's a little drone video that actually shows the difference. Um, I think what I'm going to do is go back and just, um, because we're almost out of time, I'm just going to go back and ask if there's questions. I'll share this link. It's got a lot of really cool um, images but what you can from this page what you can look at is Anderson Creek which was a restored wetland Tom's Creek which is a creek that was um, never really disturbed wasn't changed 
And then you can look at a site that we're planning to restore so it still looks like um, a disturbed habitat. So this, yeah, I don't think we have time to look at the, it's pretty neat to see the, the drone footage between these three different places. There's the really short um, 30 second clips of what these three different marshes that would originally have looked very similar what they look like um, today. But because it's late, I think I'll stop so that we don't. Does that make sense? Caitlin, to stop sure. for questions? Yeah, that um, if that's if this is uh, something that can be shared via link, um, I can just um, email it to everybody that's in the call. Um, if that works. Yeah, I'll send you. Um, I think what I'll what I can send is the um, the page that has all the lessons on it. So there's a there's also just a general about salt marshes and um, yes. So yes, that's the, that's okay. the short answer. Awesome. I'll send the link. Sounds um, good. And I'll encourage you all to look at, to watch those drone images. And actually I'm gonna, I forgot, I don't have my face. Um, so I'm gonna just end with this slide that shows. <sighs> I think I'll end with a slide that shows the three different places that I just talked about. Um, there's the explosion again. It's pretty silly. That's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if uh, looking at this um, aerial image, the bottom wet spot is that Cox Pond space. So some of the channel is still that that got reopened is still there. To the left over here, this is Anderson Creek. Um, so they dug this re-meander out based on um, images, old um, plain images of the old channel. And then the land straight ahead is the creek, I mean, the, the watershed that has yet to be restored. So um, you can see a big difference, I think, in these three things, even just looking at them. So yeah, I'll ha I'm happy to take questions. I thought I was gonna be a little bit faster. And I apologize for not being able to show my camera. Screen. No problem. Thank you so much, Jamie. That was really, really interesting. And I think there are some, a lot of differences, but also some similarities to some of the things going on in New Jersey. So <clears throat> one of them that stand out to me is the, the green crab. Um, so we share an invasive there, um, but I'll open it up to any other questions. No other questions? If there aren't questions, I'll show that footage really quick. <laughs> oh, I do have one quick question. Oh, oh sure, go ahead. Um, do you have a designated uh, keystone species there where you keep an eye on that particular species to monitor if there are any uh, invisible changes to the uh, estuary? Oh, that's a great question. Um, What we, I don't know if we necessarily call it a keystone species, but one habitat we're watching and have been watching really closely are our eelgrass habitats. And um, it's, the, it's interesting to me that the species, I think you all have the Zostra marina as an eelgrass species, and it provides a lot of the same benefits um, to as a, a habitat for juvenile um, animals for us, like the baby Dungeness crab hang out in there a lot. and. Um, the salmon will use it, and um, there's a, loads of other invertebrates that use that habitat. Um, for just our estuary, not for the whole Coos Bay, but for South Slough, um, we have seen in the last uh, five years or so a significant die-off in our eelgrass habitat. And um, so that's a, it makes a huge difference in the estuary because it's such an essential habitat. Um, yeah. And only recently scientists have really, it's, it's, it's pretty complicated the story of what happened with the eelgrass and um, scientists are still working on the best ways to restore that, that habitat. But one of the issue, one of the things that I find interesting um, is that one of the stressors for our eelgrass is temperature. 
um, air temperature because it's exposed on low tide and increasing sea surface temperatures. And um, where you are, the water tends to be warmer. And I, I lived in the Keys for a little while and there's the same species. It's you know the same species of grass, but it's just adapted for different conditions. So our eelgrass can't survive when the water gets even a little bit warmer. And, you know, the grass in Florida is living in like 80 degree temperatures. I think that's really interesting. Um, hmm. no. But I would say that the, the eelgrass is a species of concern for us. And then we have some, um, we have a few protected and endangered plant species in the reserve that we um, pay careful attention to. And there, um, that's another thing where we're, it's not a specific species, but we are studying harmful algal blooms because that's an indicator, a big indicator for climate change. So as our water chemistry changes, the plankton that live there are changing, which affects the whole food chain in the estuary. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and if folks are, maybe I'll send a couple of links to Caitlin. Um, because we do have our um, research coordinator just finished a report on the status of European green crabs for this year. Hmm. It's interesting to see that change. Someone started monitoring green crabs here um, almost 20 years ago. So you can see the data oh, interesting. where it's sort of like flat, 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 flat. And then this major spike right hmm. at that same time that the ocean temperatures got warm. So that's yeah, that'd be really interesting. Any other links or anything you want to share, um, I can email to the, the folks that are here tonight. Cool. Uh, are there any other questions? Put in the chat, take yourself off mute if you'd like. Don't see anything coming through. All right. Well, I am going to, um, it looks like no one has any other questions. So we'll end today about a minute early, <laughs> which is nice. Um, and you guys can go about your evening, but I just wanted to say thank you so much, Jamie, for taking time out of your day to talk to us and share everything about the South Slough Reserve uh, in Oregon. And if any of you guys are traveling out that way, um, I'm sure, you know, you guys can visit, um, go on the trails, go and, and see everything there is to do out there, um, you know, uh, depending on COVID though, of course. Um, but uh, that was really, really a great talk, Jamie. So thank you so much for sharing all that information. Thank cool. you very Thanks much, for Jamie. Ready? <clears throat> have a good evening. Thank you. Thank Caitlin, you for me. Mm -hmm. Caitlin, I had two quick questions for you. Oh, sure. I can hang around. Okay. All right. Well, bye, everybody. We'll, uh, we'll talk to you all soon. Bye. Take care, Barbara. Bye-bye. All right. Yeah, go ahead, George. Okay. We had a question. Caitlin, um, is your facility open yet? No, we are okay. still closed. Yeah. Okay, because uh, I'm just thinking ahead to the spring. Um, yeah. Oh, hold on. Let me. Uh, I'm gonna stop recording this. Um, hold on. Give me one second. Stop okay. Recording. I always forget that recording is going and 